Hello everyone and welcome to day 20 of Bitwise where we build the software hardware stack for a com simple computer from scratch. Um, uh, last time on, on Friday, um, we did a bunch of work on dynamic type info. Um, we sort of had a two-parter. One was doing type IDs using the type of uh, operator and the second part was doing uh, more fully fleshed out type info which can be optionally compiled in but is not mandatory to compile in because of bloat but enables a bunch of, of, of richer use cases. And so in the mainstream, we did uh, type IDs and type of, and on the extra stream, we did uh, dynamic type info. So uh, before we jump into today's topic of packages, uh, I do want to review uh, what we completed on the extra stream so people can see how that works and uh, what was done in the meanwhile in general. Uh, won't tr try to not take too long on, on uh, detailed stuff. Uh, so we can get into the meat of today's topic, but uh, I do want to cover that, uh, especially the dynamic type info for people who didn't watch the extra stream. So um, uh, let me just show you some some test cases so you can kind of get an idea for it. Um, I think this was the thing we implemented on the, uh, let me just make sure my stuff compiles. I was just doing some messing around with the compiler this morning. Yeah, let me disable that. Back and debug. All right, so um, one of the things we put in was type of, which returns a type ID, and this is a constant. Uh, and so you can use this with uh, expressions. Uh, well, actually, it works like in terms of what it can take, the syntax for what it can take. It's exactly like size of can take a, uh, an expression, or it can take a naked type name, or it can take a colon prefix type specifier, uh, and it returns the constant that uniquely identifies that uh, type. And um, so this was the thing we wrote as a demo. It's like a very simple, uh, like the very, I think the very first use case we tested. So um, this any struct, which is now um, built in, essentially, it's part of the standard preamble has two parts, it has a pointer, which is just an opaque void pointer, and it has a type ID. Um, and so based on the type ID, you determine what case to use of, of these known cases. Um, and if it's uh, an int, you cast the pointer to an int pointer and you dereference it and you call printf with a, pa a percentage D. And so you get that. Um, and the next time through, you should now get a float and it prints that. So first you get 42, and then you get one point, uh, you get some truncated version of pi. And you can see here it also uh, prints the uh, like a, a type name. So uh, printing the type name is actually an example of using type info. This stuff here can be done without any compiled in type info, just using the constants uh, generated by type of. But for printing the type, you actually need something uh, beyond type IDs. So, so let's look at how, uh, how that's done. So um, you get a type ID as an argument, which is basically just an integer. Then you call it get type info, which is a built-in function. And when you call get type info, it can return null, which basically means there's no type info for the type you requested. Um, and so you always have to be prepared for that possibility if you're writing uh, code that uses type info. You can't assume that all type info is always available. That's not reasonable. Uh, that's going to really restrict your ability to use third-party libraries to be able to reuse your code in more restricted settings where type info is, is, um, is not mandatory and so on. So um, you have to always handle the case where, um, where there's no type info. And you can see in our case, if we don't have type info, we just print the type ID of the type. So that's a good fallback. That's still a unique identifier. It's just not very informative. Um, but if we do have type info, then we get back this. Uh, and actually, I can show you the struct in the code so you know what's in there. Um, you, um, you get this type info struct back, uh, a pointer to it, rather. And um, it's it's kind of a simplified version of what we actually have internally in the compiler. So we have a kind that's it's like a tagged union, basically. It has a, a kind that specifies what kind of, of type it is. So it could be one of the primitive types, or it could be some derived type, like a pointer, array, or whatever. Um, the size, so the memory size, the alignment, um, also the name. And this is just the, um, the name is only available for ground. Maybe I'll change that. But for now, they're only available for sort of low-level things like built-in types or um, 
uh, or structs and unions and stuff like that. So it's really only for the base things, not for the derived things like pointers and cons and whatnot. You have to synthesize those yourself if you want them. Um, the count, which applies only to array type, so you know how big an array is. Uh, the base, which is a type ID, not a, not a type info pointer, but a type ID. And uh, so for something like a pointer type or an array type or a const qualified type, uh, the base type basically is, you know, the thing it wraps. So if you have a pointer to an int, the, the outer thing would be a kind uh, pointer and the base would be kind int. Uh, and if you have a struct or a union, you also have an array of these type field infos, which has the name of the field, the type ID for the field, and the byte offset of the field relative to the base of the uh, struct or union that contains it. So that's really what's in here. Um, and so the typical thing you want to do is you want to process it quite usually recursively um, in order to synthesize the data you need for whatever operation you're doing with dynamic type info. So uh, here we're just printing a string that corresponds to the type. So I mentioned uh, only base types have actual string, uh, string pointers uh, embedded in their type info. Everything else you have to synthesize it. So this is what we do here. You can see in order to, well, in this case, I guess there's just uh, an int. So that's maybe not the best example. Um, actually, let, let's uh, find something uh, richer. Um, okay. It's still the same sort of deal. So here we have a pointer. You can see we recursively print the base type, um, which is a void. So this is probably a void star, or I know it's a void star. Um, and then we print the star after it because our type notation is postfix, and that's it. So that's the sort of thing you can do with dynamic type info. This is the most the, the most basic thing where you're really just analyzing what kind of type it is. Um, but you can also really dig into the uh, the inner info. So um, actually, let me let me just let it run, and I'll show you the kind of thing it can print, and then I'll show you the code. Um, so for this function, print type info, which is just normal user code, you can implement this yourself. It's just using the data that's exposed from the type info. Um, you can see it uh, for, for structs and unions, which are, well, for, for, for any general type, it prints the type name like int or uart control if it's a struct. And then it prints some of these common fields like the size and the alignment. Uh, and then for certain specific types, it will actually recursively visit the um, the component parts like the fields of a struct or a union. Um, and so here you can see it will, um, for struct, it will print all the fields along with their names and types and also the offset. And I'm using this um, note like notation that kind of looks like ion syntax uh, in order to specify the offset. But you can see this is the sort of thing, it takes a few lines of code. Um, and that's just for doing kind of, you know, inspection sort of output only stuff, but you can also use it in the other direction where um, if I want to do a user interface, which will let me uh, edit any kind of value we have type info for, you can do things like that, right? So you have a UI and you want to display a tree view of a, a struct or something and have a, you know, a line uh, and a field for each uh, field of the struct, and you want to be able to edit it um, with some custom widget. Maybe it's just a text UI that does, say, integer parsing if it's an int field and, and then assigns that int to the memory location of the field. But that sort of thing is really easy to do here because for any given field, for example, you can just do pointer arithmetic by the offset based on the pointer to the struct in order to get a field pointer. And then you can treat that like any other, uh, any uh, datum and, and do whatever. So. Uh, this kind of stuff uh, right here is just simple printing as a demo, but you can do very, very powerful things with this. Um, yeah, so that's how it works. The implementation is not too complicated, actually, and it's almost actually unlike the type of stuff, which was uh, partly in the mainly in the resolver and the in the in the type system. Um, the type info is almost entirely in the generator because all the information already exists in the system. It's just a matter of generating it in a consumable form for the uh, for the generated C code. So uh, what we do is we just actually let me show you the generated C code for all this stuff. Um, what is it? Oh, here. So we create this big array automatically um, from the internal type uh, data structures. And uh, this array is, is indexed by type ID. 
and it gives back a pointer to a type info if, if type info exists. So you can see there's a null pointer for stuff we, uh, for whatever reason, can't resolve. In some cases, it's because certain slots have been reserved, uh, like zero always means no type. And so that, that is intentionally not associated with anything. And for other cases, it's just because we haven't, we, we haven't generated type info yet for that. So right now, um, for enums and for funks, I don't generate type info. Um, there's another case which is kind of uh, essential or what you might say intrinsic that you can't generate type info for and that's when you have an incomplete type so um, here in uh, some incomplete type this is just declared as an incomplete type so it's intentionally just like similar similarly to see it doesn't actually have an implementation but you can still have a or we don't have a definition for it so we don't know its size or anything like that but we can still have a pointer to it but um, if this is all you know about the type, then you can't generate type info, of course. So it just lists it here as incomplete. Um, we don't even say in the type info that it's incomplete. We just say null. So we don't have to handle that separately because there's not really anything useful you can do here anyway. Uh, I guess it might be useful to know the name. So maybe I'll actually make a case for that. But uh, in any case, we can't give the full type info because we don't know much about it at all other than maybe its name and that it's a structure or union or something like that. Um, but that's the idea. Um, one thing that changed compared to the first implementation we did is that size and alignment information is not directly output from our internal definitions. So if you look at our type data structure, um, in order to do constant expression evaluation and stuff like that, we actually have our own model of what size and alignment is, right? Like we need to know that in order to, you know, if someone has an array that's based on size of a type or line of a type or whatever, um, we need to know that in our type system. So we have that internally, and that's based on a model of what target we're generating code for. So the size of a pointer on 32 bits is 4, and then 64 bits is 8, right? That sort of thing. So we need to know about that when we're type checking. Um, but in order to make the C code we generate uh, maximally uh, platform invariant, even though we are in the type system are not necessarily, well, actually, we can't be platform invariant because these things can vary across platforms. Rather than just emitting the hard-coded sizes, I actually do emit size of and align of. Um, and similarly for the fields, originally I was just emitting the uh, calculated byte offsets as integers, but now I do it like this, which means that, um, you know, even if we're recompiling the C code for a platform that was not what we had in mind when we did our own type checking, this is more portable automatically. So I'm not needlessly hard coding any constants. Um, and, uh, you know, over time, I'm trying to go to try, try to follow that as a rule. We're not going to try to in some cases, it's really unavoidable, but where possible, like in type info, I'm going to, to do it this style. So anyway, that's the um, that's really it. And as far as the code, there's not much to it because we already have the data we need in our internal data structure. So it was mostly just a case of generating it and, and kind of just handling the cases. Um, so we, we you can see we have this big array. We go over each type ID. If there's an associated type ID, uh, type with a type ID, then we go and generate the type info. And then we just have a bunch of different cases. and uh, I mean, kind of, I guess, doing what you'd expect. Uh, not really uh, very technically interesting, but um, uh, but you end up with this table in the end, uh, and you can you can see these dot type fields or dot base um, point to entries of uh, of the table. So if, for example, you have a field here, it says kind, and it's type 17. The reason I use these explicit designated initializers it, rather than just using implicit array indices is so that you can kind of visually see it when you're debugging, like, oh, 17, I go and look at 17 here, so I know this is an enum. Or um, if you have a pointer type like here, you can see it says base 33, and that means, oh, base 33 is here, and it's a, uh, a const uh, of three, which I guess is um, char, so it's a pointer to a, a const char, right? Like that sort of thing, so you can see that here. Um, uh, that's that's about it for that. All right. Um, let me uh, quickly jump through other changes since then. Um, let's see here. There were a lot of bug, fix, bug fixes on Friday and Saturday. Uh, people, other people actually started using Ion seriously, uh, and so I got some great bug reports from users, especially on Discord. Uh, and I was kind of fixing stuff for them in real time. So if you want really, if you start trying to use this stuff and you want quick turnaround uh, on bug fixes, 
uh, I'm highly motivated to fix people's bugs when they uh, tell me live, and I will fix them live typically. So uh, this is really a virtuous cycle we had this going this weekend, and I got a lot of, 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 of small bugs fixed, a few big ones. Um, so yeah, a bunch of bug fixes. Um, uh, some features too, though. So let me go over those. Um, one thing is I added a, uh, a note, uh, which you can use on uh, if statements and switch statements. So the idea behind the complete note is that, I'm sure you've seen this in my own code, but I'm pretty religious about, uh, and every time I forget it, I, I uh, curse under my breath. I'm pretty religious about using this sort of stuff. So if I if I have a case analysis, I will always have a default uh, and assert zero in my default handler so that uh, I don't accidentally forget about a case and it sort of falls through and does nasty things downstream. So I'm pretty religious about this in my C code. And similarly, if I have else stuff, uh, I usually have, um, I guess there's not much here, but if you look at the parser, I think there's more. Um, yeah, like stuff like this, uh, this kind of thing here, where uh, I just make sure that if I have an else, that's sort of an else if in spirit, I will actually assert it. Um, and so I don't have to do the check but uh, in release builds, but I can at least check it in debug builds that it coheres correctly. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, I think, a good habit. Um, so one thing, I think someone requested it. Uh, I can't remember how I was motivated to do it. But in any case, I put in this feature where um, you can put this thing complete on ifs and default uh, and switches and it will basically do this code for you so if you go and look at the generated c code um, one file. Um, if you go look at the generated c code you can see it generates an assert um, and it only does that if you know if the else case is not handled if you put pound co if you put complete on something and it does handle every case it will not synthesize any new code at all so it's only if you forget about a case um, and uh, same thing for default statements here. So yeah, I think that was a, a nice little kind of five line change. And I, I know it's something I'm going to be using in my own code. And I think um, even though I, I plan to keep the base language quite simple, I think these sorts of optional modifiers that help you catch bugs, um, we're probably going to add those over time as, as they become useful. Um, so that's a good example of that. Um, the other thing is we already had pound declarations, which are these sort of top level, declaration level uh, pound directives, and we were using them for these pound includes in foreign blue code. Um, so I did a statement version of that, and uh, the proximate motivation was someone was asking for assert, and I'm of course also a hardcore assert user, so there was time to put in assert, and I, I decided to do it that way, rather, rather than using a new, uh, you know, like having a, since we don't have macros, uh, I'm going to basically be using this notation for macro-like things that are provided in the language. Um, and so the first uh, use case for that was assert. So now if you have uh, if you have this code, it will, I mean, not really surprising, but it will generate an assert on the C side using assert.h. And probably we'll have maybe a custom assert in the future, but for now it just uses assert.h's built-in assert. Um, Yeah, and there's also better error handling for a note so that if you have a typo or something, it will give you a warning. Um, there's a way to prevent avoid those warning by using this uh, declare note directive, and that's actually how things are kind of marked as being available um, for me even. So like these two uh, top level notes are actually in the preamble rather than being hard coded in the C code. Um, so you can, you can do that for your own notes if you want to have notes that are exposed through your type info, or whatever, uh, which is not available right now, but probably will be eventually. So uh, yeah, that was one thing. Um, I'm stricter about requiring C11 support now. Um, we do use a few C11 features, even though um, it's mostly C99 only. Uh, and it was, this is motivated by someone somehow getting the code to compile on a version of Visual Studio that had partial C99 support, but had a horrible runtime behavior due to SNFNF not behaving according to C99 semantics. So I'm much more uh, strict about checking this and you'll get a pound error if you uh, don't compile with, uh, on, on, on Linux or Mac, if you don't compile with a dash standard equals C11, you will get an error now. Um, 
I also added a line of and offset of, so these were always intended to be added the, to match C. These are in the systems language, you really want this. Uh, the data, of course, was already in the type info as well, so it just seemed like uh, it's weird that they're in the dynamic type info, but not available statically. So uh, you, you have this now, you have a line of, and you have offset of. Um, and you can see here, this is 16, because u size is 8, and so uh, you'll recognize this. This is basically a uh, stretchy buff header, like from, our, uh, from day one or day two or whatever. So yeah. Um, that stuff is in um, let's see here a lot of bug fixes um, one difference is that um, I mentioned I think in my original day one intro to ion and sort of the design overall design philosophy is that um, in uh, in parallel with a lot of other kind of modern takes on C like go and Swift um, more things are moved to only be statements. And we've already exploited this for a plain, what would C call simple assignment, where you just have A equals B, um, because uh, we use that for compound literal. So you don't need to use this uh, weird uh, dot uh, notation for, for these initializers. Um, and I mean, that's a small thing, but I mean, it's, it's nice. And it also means you don't have these accidental typos of, well, maybe in a context where you could do it, but like in a normal, something like an if expression, you, you will never have this typo, for example, because it's not legal syntax. Um, and I still think this is absolutely the right call for the assignment style operators, like equal, um, you know, equals and, and plus equals. But um, I had also made the same choice for plus plus and minus minus, right, for decrement and uh, increment. And uh, I was always unsure about those from the beginning because I really like the standard C idioms for doing um, for doing this sort of stuff, like stack pushes and stack pops. Um, and so I had actually meant to make those back into expressions, and that's now true um, that there are now expressions. Um, there was also yeah. Uh, and there's also a bug fix related to code generation for them. But anyway, these are now, these work like C. So uh, this makes me happy. Uh, but it doesn't, I think, sacrifice the broader goal of separating uh, statements versus expressions where it makes sense. And, and uh, that's not going to change for those other types of assignments. Uh, this also cleans up the code, actually, because previously these were handled, I mean, this was partly just me having a bad AST design, but I had decided to cram these into the same AST kind as... Uh, uh, normal statements, but then these were a special kind of assignment that didn't have a right-hand side, and so there's a weird, you know, if you have a right-hand side, then you're a normal si uh, modify assignment type of thing, but otherwise you're a, a post-increment, uh, post-decrement kind of thing. Anyway, it was kind of a mess at that level, so it cleaned up that code too as a side effect. So anyway, that's in now. Um, this is more of an internal compiler thing, but um, I used to have slightly divergent logic between uh, how I handled uh, var declarations, uh, init statements, and compound literal field initializers. And all of that code is now fully unified, um, which both means, uh, well, it means that there are some bu bugs because there were, never, there were bugs in some areas of those that weren't in others. And now if there's bugs, they should be in consistent, at least there should be consistent bugs and I can fix them in one place and it will just work for everything. So that was cleaned up massively. Um, I put in if initializers just because it was simple and I was using it in some other test code. Uh, this is exactly like in homework three. So um, you can do that. Yeah, I mean, just like in homework, uh, you, can, you, can, you can do this now. Um, I haven't added it for a while or for and not or a while, and I may not. Um, probably I will, but um, for me, this is the version that's by far the most useful in practice. So I just started by adding that. Uh, and C code is basically like what I described in the homework, I think. Um, not much to it. Uh, it. It generates an outer scope if you have this initializer, so the scoping is right. In theory, this could be removed to be more idiomatic C code if you know that this identifier isn't shadowed further down in the same scope. Um, but for now, it just uh, always generates this block. Uh, and in this case, it would actually be necessary, right? Because um, uh, there's another binding introduced here, and that would be a shadow binding, so that's not uh, legal. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so that is in um, more internal stuff. There's a really nasty uh, regression in the constant evaluator, 
Um, and f I fixed that and I realized that one of the reasons I hadn't caught it is that I didn't have a good way to test it. Um, you can you could do the standard thing that people use with static assert macros in C prior to C11, where static assert is now standard, where um, you you index an array like a dummy array type, um, and you know if it's negative then you get an error. So you can kind of generate minus one conditionally on it being true. And I could do that too, but because I don't have macros, I would have to write it out in each case manually, and so I didn't really test it uh, very much, uh, and and so we got these regression bugs. Um, and so now I, in order to deal with these and other types of kind of compile time evaluation uh, bugs uh, in, a, in a regression suite or something like that, I added static assert as a declaration note and as a statement note. So you can now use a static assert just like in C11 or C++11, uh, and you can use it either at uh, declaration scope, by which I mean top level, uh, like here. Um, so, for example, in this case, uh, this was not a synthetic test case. This was actually something I was using to test uh, parsing for these uh, hex uh, escaped uh, character literals. So you can use it for top level, and it can refer to any top level binding, by the way. So this works with out-of-order out of declarations for these top level static asserts. Um, so, or at least I actually haven't tested it. So let me, but let me show you. Suppose I do something like a static assert type of um, type of escape tester equals, um, I, I guess, I actually, I, I'm not sure exactly what, well, this would be a good one to test maybe, but if I do something like this, um, okay, so this actually doesn't work out of order, which is probably fine to be honest. Um, okay, this, I thought it worked out of order. No, I guess it doesn't. I guess it doesn't because it's not really sorted. Um, that's fine though. But anyway, yeah. But you can you can do this sort of thing. Um, and so it's it's useful for testing. Um, but also there's a um, a local version that is sequenced, and so this is fully scoped depending on where it occurs in a statement block. And so this is the kind of thing that will that's going to make compiler testing a lot easier. And I think it's convenient in user code as well, of course. But especially for me doing type, uh, compiler testing. I can do stuff like this to take type, to test type inference. For example, I can do this thing that's supposed to infer an int, and I can actually say now using type of the fact that type of is a constant is really convenient here. I can use this to say you know the inferred type of i is int, the inferred type of p is pointer to int, that sort of thing. Um, so that's in as well. Um, right now, this doesn't generate a static assert in the C code. It just uh, does a static assert in the resolver. So this is not generating a static assert on the C code side. Uh, I may do that in the future, but for now, um, this was mainly just for the uh, for static asserting internal to ion. Um, what else? Yep. And then we have these escapes I just mentioned. Anyways, I think that catches us up to uh, to today. So a bunch of stuff, uh, mo mostly smaller things, but also a lot of bug fixes. So overall, the thing should be much more solid. Um, all right, let me uh, see if there's any questions before we uh, jump into the main topic. Let's see here. All right, um, let's go into the uh, current, whatchamacallit, the uh, current uh, topic or the, the today's main topic. So I had wanted to work on this yesterday, but I was kind of beat and so I took the entire day off. Um, and uh, this has been uh, coming, I mean, I was, this would have been convenient last week when we were working on Noir, but it involves a bunch of the kind of code I don't really like doing, to be honest, namely things that are highly platform specific and have to be tested across at least three platforms. And uh, it's just kind of annoying to do in C especially. Um, and so uh, that, that is packages, the package design. So let, let, me, uh, let me first talk about what it is from a high level feature perspective. 
um, and then we'll, we'll start working on the implementation today and I will continue working on it into the extra stream. It will probably take at least the extra stream to finish the feature uh, for today. But let's start with the design and, and get started on the coding in the mainstream. Um, so packages. Um, I would say it ha packages have uh, uh, three parts, uh, at least, maybe more. Let's say two parts, yeah, three parts, let's say three parts. Uh, physical organization. So uh, you want to have a way to organize your source files into um, uh, into different kinds of structure. So you, you of course have, you can have different code spread across different .ion files, but you also want to be able to have multiple files that constitute a single, um, a single package. So a package is potentially, a, it can be some redistributable unit, right? So you're distributing a library that contains um, a bunch of code that's designed to, designed to be used together, like it's referring to other things in the same package and so on. Uh, and so that's part of it, it's just the physical organization, both in terms of distribution when something has been built, but also organization when you're developing it, like how you organize your source files. Um, so that's one part of it. Um, uh, the other part of it is um, kind of, uh, I guess you could say namespacing. Um, uh, you know, imports, um, selective, renaming, uh, 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 import, um, uh, se selective, um, uh, well, I, gu I guess not really, sorry, maybe this is number three. So, so I guess there's sort of like import, um, you know, dependency management, um, which is uh, use other packages, uh, manage dependency graph, et cetera. And then there's namespacing, which is um, when you're using another package, you it, it, it also acts as a unit of namespacing if you want it to. Like, so by default, um, you know, you use another package, it can use certain short names internally that may not be uh, uh, available in your local namespace. And so you can have things like that are just called file um, but maybe you have a thing called file and uh, it helps you manage that. So you can do either um, explicit path notation, uh, bulk, uh, you know, bulk import, uh, selective renaming, etc. cetera. Um, so I think these things are kind of familiar. And so from, uh, from user code perspective, if you have something like, uh, I don't know, if you're importing, so we're working on the Noir library right now. So suppose you're importing Noir, um, Maybe you can just do this. This is sort of the the most basic form of import, and then you can start using it. So you can do like, um, uh, what's an example? You could do um, maybe this. So it, I'm just referring to the identifiers that are already in the package. So you take a pointer to um, this global that's in there. Uh, and then if you have your own main function, um, maybe you have, uh, you have something like this, and uh, this while app update, um, and do things like this. Uh, and I guess I should also allow actually to do uh, just this, this sort of thing, where. Um, um, what do you call it? You can, um, you know, rather than just having pointers, you can sort of selectively import names. And maybe you could just do it like this. Actually, this would be one option. Um, but but actually, let's first do the thing that's fully explicit, and then you would say something like if noir app, um, uh, I don't know, window moved. window was moved, you know, something like this. This would be sort of the fully explicit version for the namespacing. Um, but of course you want some ability to control things um, at a finer grain and at a coarse grain. So for example, you can do, 
Uh, and, and I'm, I'm not sure if this will be part of the import directive uh, or uh, you always have to do it separately, but there will be some sort of way of importing names. So you could do, for example, suppose you're okay with, with doing this stuff for the function calls, but you want to have a shorthand for this abstract because you're going to be accessing it a lot, but you're only going to be calling these functions in two locations. You could do something like this. Um, and now you could, you know, you could write it like this and you could do, um, I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, you could do stuff like this. So that's that. that that's um, and and I have a bunch of things planned here, um, for uh for this stuff. Like, you you can obviously do these piecemeal things, but you I also want to make it e easy to import things in bulk. Like, I don't want to have a strong like I think in Go, for example, uh, with Go packages, you actually don't have the ability to do bulk imports of all exported symbols from another package. And the, I guess that's one of the cases where Go has a very strong opinion because of what, what things they're designing the language for. But for me, uh, I sometimes think that, you know, if I have an OpenGL package where I want to have everything be prefixed with GL, like in the GL style or whatever, you know, uh, importing that in bulk is fine, right? And maybe there is another way to do that. Like you can remove the prefix and do GL create buffer rather than GL GL create buffer. But in any case, I don't want to be kind of ideological about this. If you want to, um, you know, or SDL is another example. Uh, SDL's official identifier names or things like this. Um, suppose you have an SDL package. You don't want to have to write this. You could remove this entirely. You could rename it to the language's own convention. But if you want to have the exact identifiers from the C library, which has a lot of value because it means you can look them up verbatim by just Googling them, then you want to be able to do a bulk import and have the full names because they're already the official versions are already prefixed. So I definitely want to make it easy to do these kind of bulk import, uh, bulk, uh, bulk using of another uh, namespace. So anyway, um, this is roughly what's what's planned in terms of the feature. Um, when you do an, an import, um, it sets up a package dependency. It means that the current package depends on the package that's referenced. Um, and there's not allowed to be any cyclic dependencies, right? So it has to be a sortable graph uh, with, with, no, with no cycles or loops. Um, that hopefully uh, makes sense. Uh, this is rather unlike how things work in C, for example, where if you have, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's pretty easy for two things that have separate, uh, uh, that where you separate out the .h uh, for them to actually call into each other. Uh, and you can't do this with, with this system. Um, it, you can generally restructure your code if you're ever in a case where that seems to be required. But um, to me, this seems like a, a reasonable constraint you, that uh, it kind of encourages good physical organization anyway. Uh, what was the other thing I wanted to mention? Th so there's a whole question here of sort of package path namespace. So if I do, um, suppose I have a directory structure. I should mention, by the way, that for the directory structure, uh, the idea is that it's going to mirror the package hierarchy uh, from the program language point of view. So uh, if you do import noir, it means that at the top level of the package root uh, of the package path, there's going to be a directory called noir. Um, and um, it will have a bunch of .ion files. So uh, noir, pa noir package will be located essentially here. It will be constituted by all the ion files in this directory. Um, if, uh, if there's also a GPU package, then it will be like this and so on. Um, if you have, um, this brings up a question of absolute versus relative path with uh, which different languages have chosen to handle differently. So C, of course, you have this whole notion of uh, of this versus this, which is like a system include versus a, I can't remember if they call it a user include, but whatever they call this, there's two different sort of paths that are usually associated with these two types of includes. Um, and um, Different languages sort of have different takes on that whole thing of, of, of relative versus absolute types of things. Uh, the way I plan to handle it is that if you don't specify anything, this is always absolute. So if you do import noir and you have and you're some weird sub package of something else, but you happen to have a noir sub package, this will always refer to the top level noir package. If you want to have a relative path, you have to use a prefix dot. 
Um, this is how Python does it as well. So if you want to, if you're inside, you know, if you're inside, uh, I don't know, noir.ion uh, and you want to import uh, noir uh, GPU, you could either do it like this, uh, if you want to do it in a way that couples to the absolute path, or you can do it like this. Um, but uh, you can never get relative without an explicit prefix. Everything is always absolute uh, by default. Um, you know, something like this. All right. So this is sort of a random overview. It wasn't very organized, but this is the sort of thing that I'm going for. Um, and one thing you'll notice is we need, I'm going to probably tackle this more or less in order in, of, of the implementation, even though I could start on this, some of this stuff first, I'm going to tackle it uh, in, in order and actually do physical organization first. So managing uh, the kind of directory structure and discovering files that need to constitute a package and so on. So that requires us to write a bunch of directory code, which is not portable. Um, there's some POSIX stuff for it, but on Windows, you can't use it unless you want to use a third party library. So we need to write platform specific code and if def it and so on. So that's no fun, but um, let's just jump in and start working on that. How are we doing on time? Okay, so let's just start working on that. That's pretty pedestrian code, but it needs to be done. So let's just do it. Um, Let's see here. Um, I think probably the way to go is to create a um, to create a new file. What's the short code here? Um, Control Shift A. Um, to create a new file, and I will call it os.c. And um, and it's kind of going to be the front end for all the OS specific stuff. So it's going to be excluded from build. We're going to um, pound include it here, so it can still use the common stuff, but uh, is before everything else if they want to use it. Um, let's make sure that compiles. Oh, so it actually built OS.c. Thought I excluded it. Why is it not excluded? Oh, release. This always happens. All right. Um, and then I'm going to um, pound include uh, os win32.c. Um, And for now, just have an error if you try to compile on a different platform. Um, of course, I have to add that file as well. And um, so let's look at Isn't it find find next? What's it called? This one. You could use the Win32 stuff directly, but this is maybe slightly more convenient and C-like. Um, so, um, that's the name of the file. Oh, and this is not excluded from build, so let me exclude that. And um, let's see what these functions are. I can never use these in ages. For now, I'm going to use the ASCII functions, and uh, so I don't want to deal with Unicode conversion, um, but I really should later. Um, so, right, find first is how you get started. Um, I think the interface I'm going to expose is going to be like an iterator interface, much like all of the platforms basically have an iterator-like interface as the standard way you list stuff. 
um, and I'm going to expose that too. And then on top of that, we can put, if you want to have like a stretchy buff convenience function that exhaustively lists everything by just pumping the iterator and pushing stuff onto a stretchy buff, we can do that as step two. But for the portable uh, layer, let's do uh, the iterator. And so I think you want to have something like a dear find uh, iterator. Um, and um, I guess we'll need to have this. Okay, so that's the struct. Uh, there's this find data. Maybe that's the main thing for now. Um, and then basically what I want to have is, well, let's see what find first takes. So there's a file spec. I think that's like a path with potential wildcards and stuff like that. Um, See here. All right, so this can include wild cards. Um, so um, let's say we have like a deer find, and you provide it a uh, iterator, and you provide it a uh, well, we can call it a file spec. And uh, let's see what we call there. Um, okay, find first uh, file spec. Pointer, yeah, and it returns an int pointer. I see. So there's two parts to it. There's the handle, and there's um. something like this. Um, let's see here. I see, so minus one. Um, so I want. To, I think I want to have a field called valid. This is so. So down here, we're going to have these underscore prefix things that are kind of internal and not part of the cross-platform interface. And then we'll have some fields that are cross-platform uh, interface visible. And uh, so we'll have a handle, and then. Um, um, well, let's say iter uh, valid is if handle is not equal to minus one. I think I actually don't want this file data. I think I want to have my own version of the data we care about um, in the struct. Um, And then we need to figure out what parts of this struct we want to expose. Um, I mean, I guess we might as well expose some stuff while we're here. Um,
Yeah. I wonder. I mean, I, I know I know this whole 256 limit is actually a lie, but eh, it's kind of convenient. Do I want to? Well, given this interface actually returns max path. First off, is this actually defined? Um, Um, did this cross the error? No, it's not what it is. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Um, Now let's just make this a bool. Um, So let's see here. So it's valid if it's this. There's an error if uh, if it's minus one and error no is not equal to this. Because I think if you just get no entries, you don't want to count that as an error. Um, 
that's just an empty set of matches, which is a totally valid outcome, um, I believe. This is slightly different because this is the curve file info still. Um, and then for the next stuff, again, if we get zero, right, so no ant means no more. And so if that is the case, um, we set this to false. What? That's not true. I think you set it to false in any case, um, but you set it to error if. Um, Um, let's see, and this is the same logic we're already doing, so clearly kind of this stuff um, deserves to be moved over. I can do this unconditionally, but it would maybe be nicer to um, Not error. Uh, so if we're not done, um, if we're done, um, Use it wrong. File info. Um, let's call this set state. Um, this is not. It's equal to this. And. And here it's done if this is not equal to zero, I believe. Um, We want to have some finishing function, and I think the way we're going to make this work is um, it will finish by itself if we just exhaust the, uh, the set of things. Um, Use an underscore. Um, so we'll we'll close this. You can do this manually, basically, if if you finish prematurely. Um, but I think what you also want to do is um, Uh, 
uh, I think you also want to do this if something finishes. Um, and you only do this if it's valid. So you probably have to do it before you do other stuff. Like um, if done, do find free. No, actually, let's not. Let's not do it here. Let's do it outside. I think that's probably more proper. So we don't have to distinguish because we can share this code between the two cases, but maybe we can't quite distinguish it there. Um, so I think when you do the init, if you get back minus one, there's nothing to free, right? Um, Do a find next, you update the state. Um, something like this. So it takes the file handle and a pointer to the file info struct. Which looks good to me. It looks good to me. Don't know if that cut off OBS. Sorry. I clicked a button that screwed into the monitor. This um, MSVC errors are getting worse. It's ridiculous. Um, this board handle, so I don't have to confuse myself with whether that's present or not. So it says it's undefined because presumably, I mean, it's right here, right? It's presumably because the type doesn't match. This is the right type. This should be coercible to bool. Here we have a pointer to find data, which again looks good to me. Iter valid, blah, blah, blah. Oh, here? Is that really? So because there's one error, Is it not a type def? There's underscore t. It must be a type def, right? Okay, maybe it's not a type def.
these MSBC errors are seriously getting insane. So I think what is happening is it assumes it's an int because it hasn't seen a definition, and then there's this whole cascading chain of shit from there. Um, let's test it. I'm sure, it doesn't work. But. Okay, minus one should now no longer be valid, but it's also not an error, which is correct. It doesn't copy stuff over. Um, and it closes it, and we're done. So that was that actually worked for that test case. Now let's try with something that intentionally doesn't match anything and see how that works. We get minus one straight off the bat, um, and so we should never be valid in the first place. But we should also not have an error because um, it's just no entries. We don't copy anything over. Um, I think that's reasonable. I think probably the invariant is you should not be looking at the state of this thing as val if valid is not true. So we. I mean, it would be maybe nice to zero fill this or something like that um, as a precaution. Because if there is a bug, that would make it easier to spot. So, for example, um, I think it would be reasonable to just mem zero it. Um, see what we had previously. So there's some garbage here. Um, so we mem zero it. And so if accidentally you access the string pointer, you're just going to get an empty string, which seems reasonable. Um, all right. Um, that was probably as 
about as good as it could have gone given um, well so here's one thing we could do uh, we could intentionally uh, free it after one iteration and see how that works Okay, so one thing you definitely want to do is you want to um, you want to set this. Uh, the way I'm thinking with the relationship between valid and error is that you're allowed to look at error regardless of whether valid is true or false because sometimes valid will be false because you've run out of stuff and then you can check error to see sort of sub, uh, secondary information and right now it's just a bool but uh, this could be more extensive um, but that's my thinking so you always want to set these in conjunction you never want to set just one of if you set this to false but there's a lingering error flag that would be incorrect um, i think so you can see here we're always setting them in conjunction all right, that looks reasonable. Um, the other thing you could do is to build a stretchy buff utility function on top of this, um, which you might as well do. Um, what's this called? Find buff. And here it's just you provide a file spec and you get back a stretchy buff. Um, and so the way that's going to work is you, let's see here, um, you basically do this kind of thing. And every time there's an entry, you um, you stir dupe the path because the path is a temporary static object. Um, and then you buff push that. Um, and uh, I think that's it. And then as a convenience, well, actually let's not free it because this is the sort of thing that just assessed it here. So this would be um, one thing. Uh, then you could also do find buff. Was it seeing sturdy was deprecated? Okay. It's not being rebuilt, it's just because we started doing something else. Let's just make sure that works. Um, okay, let's test this. Actually, let, let's make sure the code. Let's step through the code at least once. Um, yeah, it's reasonable. Uh, 
the name goes out of scope real quick. Okay, so that does work. So yeah, I think in terms of interface, this is roughly um, this is not really set state. I guess it is. Let's call it update. Um, I think this is about what you want in terms of interface. So the, the iterator interface for cross-platform stuff um, is reasonable. The kind of things you may want to add is an ability to filter on things like whether something is a directory or a file. Um, but for the basic stuff, this is a good place to start at least. Uh, and then you have, you can see a simple convenience layer if you just want a buff of everything. But most of the time this is, uh, an iterator is fine. Um, and actually, this thing here is cross platform. So this should be moved into here. Um, so let's call that this. And let's move this into this file. Actually, all of this should be in the general file. There's really no reason to have this stuff here. be nice and clean about it. The fact that free doesn't take, by the way, this is uh, one of the mistakes in C. Free should have taken, taken a const void pointer. Uh, this is uh, a small design mistake in the standard lab, in my opinion, <clears throat> because you always end up doing this stuff, which is obnoxious. Um, all right, let's just make sure that runs. Um, okay, so we still have 10 minutes before we have to move to the extra stream. Maybe, um, uh, I mean, this is a very tiny piece of code and I feel it's kind of ashamed that this kind of thing, sort of thing has to be coded, but has to get done, unfortunately. Um, maybe I will do Q and A now and then switch to the extra stream. So, uh, since this is a natural stopping point before we uh, start actually using this for, um, exploring the directory structure and determining, uh, you know, finding packages and stuff. Let's see here. Some good feedback from Sean about whether to have the uh, the portable abstraction be iterator based versus um, get everything at once the stretch in the stretch above based. Um, yeah, I'll have to think about that. Maybe yeah, maybe I should just make the stretchy buff interface uh, like that. Um, 
So maybe I'll just make Sturf, uh, Durfine buff be the actual uh, portable one. So, so uh, w what Sean is saying is if I try to do the wildcard version on POSIX, apparently um, if I use read dir, let me see what read dir. I mean, it's been so long since I do done this stuff, uh, unfortunately. I don't remember exactly how the POSIX one is different. All right, so read deer is the iterator version, but this one doesn't do wildcards, right? There is a version that does wildcards, though. Scan deer. Oh, I see. So if I use scan deer, then I can do wildcard stuff, right? Although I guess I still have to, no, that doesn't necessarily help. We still have to do my glob matching. Not not that it's very hard, but um, I could have sworn there was a POSIX thing for matching, but maybe that's not a core POSIX function. Let's see. All right, um, let's see. Okay, I, I don't see a lot of questions. Yeah, maybe this is not quite the right abstraction. Uh, I, I mean, doing a glob filter is like very easy to do. So maybe I'll just do that um, and not rely on the file spec filtering being at the OS level. That's fine too. Uh, but anyway, yeah, let me cut over to the extra stream. Uh, and then maybe I'll do that. I'll do the globbing myself. So anyway, uh, see everyone in a sec. If I cut over.